you have to be um, sort of present for the entire session, or the majority of the session at least, in order to be eligible for this uh, for this credit. Um, and also, this is brought to you, or this presentation is brought to you by the Midas Elite Center. Um, here at Midas, we specialize in giving sort of several types of presentations out to engineers for professional development hours. Um, this is one of several, and I'll talk about um, other opportunities you have to take advantage of these courses later on. Okay, so first I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, so our speakers today will be Constantino Singros and Alan Popel from Langan Engineering. Um, so just a brief introduction for uh, Constantinos. He's currently a project manager at Langan in the uh, New York office. Um, and he received his uh, master's degree in structural engineering from the University of Athens. And he received his PhD in structural geotechnical engineering from the City University of New York. Okay, and also um, Alan Popel, I believe, has a small uh, part in this presentation as well. He's currently the senior principal in Langan Engineering. Um, and he received his master's um, and as well as his bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Okay, so then a brief introduction of the Kingdom Tower. Um, currently, the tower is still under construction, and it's located in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. And the design height is one kilometer, or 3,280 feet. And when completed, it will be the world's tallest building at an estimated cost of 1.23 or excuse me, $1.23 billion. Um, and it was constructed or designed using a pile raft foundation, which was designed with Midas GTS, which is a 3D finite element software specifically for geotechnical um, and structural design. Um, so uh, Costas and Alan will be going into greater detail about um, the design of the pile raft foundation. OK. Um, so once again, the, uh, the foundation was designed heavily using uh, Midas GTS which provided you know, several advanced solutions for the uh, Power Rack Foundation. Um, so for those of you who have questions about Midas GTS, just save those for later. Um, you can learn more about the program and our software programs in general at MidasUser.com. And if you have any questions that you'd like to direct toward us, feel free to email us at MidasSoft at MidasUser.com. OK, so now that um, I provided an introduction, what I'll do is I'll turn the time over to uh, Constantino Singros, and he'll uh, give you the uh, the uh, lecture on the uh, the foundation of the Kingdom Tower. understand uh, what instances and laboratory tests uh, are important uh, so let design parameters for this uh, part of the group, uh, project. The steps to develop uh, a model a big foundation using the final element method. The interaction process between the structure and the foundation is clear. And uh, the first process to select, to select the length of the foundation element. This is a uh, rendering of the tower. Uh, we can see on the left also part of the podium, part of the foundation. It's going to be a very slender uh, tower with a high to mid aspect ratio of 12 to 1. And just to put things in perspective, the spire is approximately as high as tall as the Chrysler uh, building in uh, New York City. When we talk about the subsurface investigation, uh, the subsurface conditions on the site, laboratory testing, electric, electrical testing, and uh, 
in situ who stay testing that we perform that uh, test files and uh, other things. This is the boring rotation plan that shows uh, the outline of the tower and the locations of the boards performed at uh, the center and the legs of the tower. Uh, the boring at the center was extended to 200 meters below the ground surface which was at the time the deepest uh, boring in uh, South, which is where the King of Tower may be located. The general structure has the patients, uh, consists of uh, a superficial layer of uh, sand uh, to two meters thick, followed by coralline uh, limestone, which is up to 50 meters thick, and mudstone uh, gravel layer over uh, compressible decomposed sandstone, gravel conglomerate layers, and uh, finally the more competent uh, sandstone layer at around uh, 120 meters from the ground surface. Time of storm that were uh, recovered. You can see uh, the impression of the seas and the model of the world. And this is uh, what the very complete weather and sandstone uh, looks like at a depth of 85 to 90 meters. We perform unconfined uh, compression strength of tests for uh, a number of samples and uh, we show that typically the strength rate from uh, about 1 to 3 megapascals or about uh, 10 to 30 tons per square foot. Of interest is uh, the area between uh, 70 and 90 meters uh, below the surface where uh, there was a drop in the strength of uh, the material and uh, it was about a uh, couple megapascal of the fire of the PSM. We performed a series of tests to develop a... Uh, Hello, Costas. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm getting a couple of complaints here about the audio. Apparently, um, do you think you could speak a little closer to the microphone? Uh, uh, several engineers are having a little trouble hearing you. Can you um, Hold on. So, yeah, for those of you who are having some trouble hearing, um, Costas will try to speak a little closer to the microphone. So just uh, type in to the chat box and let me know if you can hear him better. Okay, no, not yet. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll try to uh, okay. talk a little louder. So, uh, we performed a series of uh, in situ laboratory tests to determine an appropriate uh, design modules of the formation for the different uh, soil and uh, rock layers. We used uh, information from instrumented uh, unconfined compressive strength tests, pressure meter tests, triaxial tests and uh, tests uh, are and we used uh, information that was back calculated from uh, in situ load tests and uh, information uh, are calculated from uh, very low strain tests uh, for example information coming from uh, survey velocity tests and uh, we saw that uh, an appropriate uh, range uh, varied from the top uh, or the top 10 to 40 meters between 400 and 600 megapascals and dropped significantly at the zone of uh, decomposed uh, sunset. We examined not only overall the beds below the tower but also individually the beds below each leg of the tower to make sure that there is uh, consistency among the results and uh, we took that into account when uh, we selected our parameters. These are pictures of the low test of the site. To the left are pictures of the also uh, testing that was performed at the uh, port piles. And on the right side are uh, pictures of the putting load test that was uh, performed uh, on top of the coralline lines of the plane. This is the result of the putting load test that showed that uh, for approximately a segment of 10 millimeters, uh, we obtained the most 
Okay, thank you. So, uh, this was a, a typical configuration of the OSEL testing, where uh, we used two tiers of OSELs to better differentiate between the response of the door of the board file and the response of the site tier. Uh, we, these are uh, approximately 1.5 meters uh, in uh, diameter uh, piles, and uh, we are going to see that uh, for the length uh, of uh, for the length of about 45 meters, the capacity was about uh, 35 uh, kilo megajoules. So these are uh, some typical results of the OSEL testing, and uh, these are uh, very this is very useful information, especially when uh, we go to do later our finite element modeling to model the interface between uh, uh, the rock and the pile. We were able to substantiate an uh, ultimate uh, side shear uh, resistance of about 500 kilopascals using uh, polymer as uh, drilling fluid. We performed these tests uh, for uh, virus, uh, virus events and uh, using various uh, drilling fluids. <coughs> Some of the early analysis. This uh, plan shows the locations of the shear walls uh, marked with red. Uh, you can see that uh, the, there is an absence of shear walls at the middle of the tower. And uh, the low takedown for its area of the beams at the middle of the tower, we noticed that it was more or less uh, equal to about 200,000 tons. So overall, uh, we noticed that the foundation was uh, loaded uh, uniformly. Some basic foundation statistics. The raft area that we ended up using is about 3,200 uh, square meters or 35,000 square feet with a total gravity loan of 860,000 tons applying a uniform pressure of 2.65 megapascals close to 30 tons per square foot and supported uh, on uh, 275 with an individual uh, initial capacity of 32 megalitons, about 3,600 tons. Some of the considerations for selecting the foundation Early on, we realized that the tower weight was uh, too great to be supported by a shallow foundation. So we had to go with a thick foundation using either board pipes or barrettes. Barrettes are uh, essentially pipes with an uh, orthogonal uh, construction. We had concerns of the presence of gravel below the limestone uh, layer that would uh, interfere with the installation of uh, the foundation. The presence of a soft and decomposed sandstone and uh, the high depth of the compact sandstone. Regarding the capacity of the limestone, uh, just uh, indicatively, the estimated analytical carry capacity of about 2.5 megapascals, and uh, using the various factors of safety for um, different types of working. So we ended up with an allowed bearing capacity of uh, about 830 kilopascals for uh, gravity loads. When we compare that with uh, 2.65 megapascals we mentioned earlier, we can understand why a side of foundation is not easy. Regarding the fire uh, lengths, uh, for a 45 meter space, we could uh, achieve a geometrical uh, allowable capacity of uh, 42 megajoules for uh, the average. We understood very on that this was not a very capacity problem, but it was going to be a differential settlement type of problem. So we had to start with some uh, calculations and uh, perform some initial uh, block analysis using the final.
Okay. And then uh, continue with uh, more uh, uh, more appropriate uh, finite elements, uh, finite element analysis uh, using a one-step procedure, which is the regular uh, way, and the multi-step or an iterative procedure, which we're going to be talking about. Uh, for the kind of calculations, uh, there are a couple of uh, methods available uh, out there. Uh, one is a typical uh, two-thirds, one-third uh, uh, method where uh, you estimate uh, the stress of two-thirds of the depth and use elastic uh, solutions to estimate the same. The other is the Baker method, which uh, this is a uh, similar assumption to estimate the same. The total settlement of the model at the top of the foundation. The new analysis essentially is that of taking the time to model 270 files by themselves because they were close in space, you could uh, consider uh, the enforced uh, rock area as a block, attribute the appropriate elastic properties to the block, and then, uh, and then uh, do your analysis. I would like to talk about the conventional uh, one-step method for finite element analysis. Essentially, we are talking about the fine graph foundation consisting of 270 four files, a meter and a half in diameter, supporting a four and a half meter thick uh, structural graph, which at some points becomes thicker, with some initial file lengths of 45 meters and 75 meters. And we also considered another uh, scheme of uh, barrett uh, foundations, 1.2 by 2.8 meters. Early on, we understood that for this magnitude of the problem, we needed to find the critical parameters but, uh, and focus on uh, defining those parameters uh, well that, uh, that influence the problem uh, the most. So one of them was the thickness of the graph. Another was the locations and geometry of the piles, which is mostly the length of the pile that uh, makes a difference. The soil and rock modules of the formation. And then the method of construction. What kind of thing we introduce and how that uh, interacts with the pile uh, rock or pile soil interface. In typical finite element uh, modeling function, the input consists of uh, defining the geometry and the material properties of uh, the rock, the piles, the soil and rock layers, having mm -hmm. appropriate elements uh, such as uh, using point elements, area or line elements for the various uh, parts of the metal, defining the boundary conditions and defining the loading, uh, the construction staging, taking into account the set point of the foundation and the power units. This is uh, what the finite element mesh looks like. To the left, it's a box of uh, 200 by 300 by 300 uh, meters. And uh, to the right, you can see that inside this box uh, is uh, described the uh, by uh, graph foundation. The rock has uh, three wings that are approximately 15 meters wide by 60 meters long. And uh, again, the piles are one and a half meters in diameter and the pile is in length between 45 and 75 meters. The mesh becomes finer as uh, you get closer to the foundation and becomes uh, coarser as you get away from the mountain. Now, you can see the various uh, layers uh, described, uh, the coronary limestone layer, and the rest. Typical uh, soil and rock constitutive models consist of the elastic, uh, which is uh, the easiest uh, model uh, because it only needs three parameters. And uh, moving to more complicated models like the board long, where you need to assign also a friction angle and a, a position uh, value to your uh, layers. A modified multi-level soil handling model. This uh, 
modified uh, multi long and short story models were not used uh, in this time because uh, there was no need And the multi long was used along with the foot ground, which is a model uh, uh, for a uh, typical uh, structure models for the raft. Uh, you can use an elastic with volume elements or uh, you can use uh, two dimensional uh, plane elements. For the points, you need to make it a bit more. If you have uh, uh, a bit more of a selection, you can use uh, volume elements with or without an interface, beam elements with or without interface, and embedded beam elements uh, with an interface. So, the best uh, model is to use uh, solid uh, elements uh, with an interface. And this is on uh, the left, but uh, for a foundation that have more than 30 bytes, it becomes very cumbersome to model, and then the computer model takes uh, too long to run, and it crashes if uh, too many. An intermediate situation is the beam solid the connectivity model, where you have the file described as a beam, and not the volume elements. For situations of uh, the large numbers of files, the model where the File is uh, modeled with a beam, and uh, there's a special interface between uh, the file and the solid is used. Uh, this is the best model, and it's, uh, it's sufficiently accurate that can handle a large number of files. This was what was used for this problem. Typical loading conditions uh, the solid foundation circuit needs to be included. Column and wall loads can be model the spawning loads, line loads, and pressure loads, and uh, the foundation construction space is uh, important. For this project, there was no basement, so the uh, construction staging was uh, simple. simple. Initially, we used uh, two different uh, computer programs with two different uh, users uh, to compare against each other, and the results between the two different programs were very similar. We continued with the uh, initial uh, finite element results. This is for the scheme of using 45 meter uh, files. And we saw that uh, this uh, scheme was yielding a segment at the center of the foundation of about 180 millimeters and differential segments of about uh, 60 millimeters. A similar model that has uh, 75 meter uh, files at the center was able to limit the anticipated segments to 160 millimeters at the center and the differential segments which were of uh, 1% to about 50 millimeters between the center and the edge of the foundation. The finite elements uh, can also provide uh, very pressure portals, uh, such as those uh, depicted here. And uh, we can see that the uh, stresses are higher at uh, the edges of uh, the earth. And there is a little bit of concentration at the bottom. This is a cross section that uh, leads in the table along the important properties used to model the different uh, layers. And uh, this is a very useful uh, way to present the analysis to appear in the team so they can uh, easily check their assumptions and uh, model uh, to a model for a person. Now, the structural engineer's framework for, for this project was that uh, we have a uniform loading as a virtual uniform loading as we saw earlier. Uh, about 200,000 uh, colonies per uh, leg. And uh, there is a foundation based on the fact that it was uh, four and a half meter uh, thick ground. Uh, as a result, uh, we were expecting a uniform sediment, which would result in a uniform uh, single K uh, value, which is uh, a spring or a volume of some reaction. And uh, eventually it would result in uniform fine loads and uniform wall stresses. These uh, were uh, the results that the structural model was okay. 
However, uh, as geotechnical engineers, we are aware that if we know there is a footing to obtain uh, uniform settlements below the footing, the stress distribution cannot be uniform, but it has to be non uniform with higher stresses at the ends. This is what the theory of elasticity predicts. And accordingly, there cannot be one single day value that can uh, model this behavior, but there has to be at least two different daily values to model what happens at the center and at the ends. We started noticing uh, some deviations between the results uh, of the structural model and the geotechnical model, and uh, those uh, differences were mostly at the high loads at the wings of the foundation. We noticed that uh, we were getting very high loads at the piles at the edges, whereas the fraction engineer was obtaining uh, uniform uh, loads. To check uh, whether of, uh, if this is a fluke, we made the fluke where uh, with the process we plotted with the pile axial load for its file versus the distance of uh, starting from the center of the rack going outside to the legs. And we can see that the pile load started to increase and uh, to check that we also plotted the vertical stresses of the coralline limestone along the, one of the legs of the foundation and we saw that indeed they follow the same trend. They start, sorry, they start increasing as you go towards the end. And this is consistent with the theory of elasticity. So we knew that uh, the structural model and the geotechnical model were giving, uh, they were not uh, capturing the effect uh, correctly. The response of the soil foundation to the superstructure system was not captured accurately, and the foundation skills needed to be refined. On top of that, the effect of the superstructure statements it will be better captured uh, by the That led us to uh, change our approach and instead of using a one-step procedure, and we will talk about what we did exactly, we used a multi-step procedure. Let's start with a simple case of a rough foundation, no parts. The special engineer provides the coding loads to the geotechnical engineer. The geotechnical engineer does a finite element analysis, uh, predicts uh, settlements, and provides a uh, weekly space to the structural engineer. The structural engineer runs uh, his or her model with the new screens, predicts uh, foundation settlements, and then there is an iterative process to update the weekly screens until the settlements between the structural model and the geotechnical model convert. This is one step process if the special engineer only provides the cooling loads to the geotechnical engineer one time. The multi step process would be if at the end of the convert solution the structural engineer checks uh, the cooling loads and sees that uh, if, if they see that there are changes in the cooling loads filter that were caused by the linear strains, then supply the geotechnical engineer with a new set of point loads. And then this uh, cycle line gets repeated again. So this is the process for us. If we have a foundation that is uh, combined by RAP, then in addition to the RAP settlements, uh, we would require convergence between the geotechnical and the structural model on pine loads. The load sharing between pies and subgrade, the pool uh, or wall loads uh, for the structural engineer between iterations, and the iterations uh, we, they will continue until uh, the wall loads between successive iterations are below a certain percentage. For this project, uh, a high accuracy was uh, required, so a 5% uh, tolerance was uh, set. 
Now, for the 45 meter speed, when we started the whole of this procedure, we saw that they required many iterations and the results did not always compare. It was simple very conventions, it required that they divide the rush in many small areas and provide springs for all those areas. The special engineers started predicting in this model high stresses of the walls. And overall, the stress level in the pain increased considerably when we started doing this method. This is to give you a better idea of what was happening. At the top are the results of the geotechnical model, and at the bottom are the results of the structural model. So, we, for the first iteration, we had this uh, sort of settlement contours, and we provided the strings to the structural engineer who in turn ran their model and predicted this uh, sediment model, which did not match our sediment model. So they ended up giving us a new set of polyols. We rerun uh, our analysis and predicted a new sediment model. And we followed this uh, method. And as you can see, uh, for this uh, type of foundation with 45 meters, uh, meter long pipes, the terrain, the sediment of photos did not uh, appear to compare us. This is uh, a plot that shows that the stress at the wings of the structure starts to increase and compared to the stress at the walls of the center of the building, the winds uh, were about more than uh, two times higher. And this uh, could not be tolerated. So this uh, led us to revise our foundation scheme. So what we did was we compared the foundation response without any iterations. So we started from basics, just one set of boilers, and we compared the foundation, the second of boilers between the 45 meter scheme and the scheme that had the uh, that had the uh, lot of piles at the center. And we show that the 45 meter scheme uh, leads to a significant redistribution of wall loads, whereas a deeper scheme leads to a minor redistribution. So it was an easy choice uh, to make. Either we would have to increase the stiffness of the foundation to limit the redistribution of uh, stresses in the structure. All the structure would have to change its thickness, which uh, was not prepared. So we decided to increase the stiffness of the foundation. Once we started increasing the stiffness of the foundation, the relative distribution of the bilateral loads started to change. So instead of, instead of noticing that the axial loads at the edges are much higher than the axial pile loads at the center of the graph, they start becoming more uniform. Then there was a, the question of uh, where do we stop the parts? And uh, this is a good representation to see what the uh, options we have. To try to put the pipes inside the concrete sandstone layer, we need to very high lengths and uh, it would not be feasible to construct. If we try to stop them uh, at uh, an elevation between 110 and 125, we would create a hard spot uh, at the pipes, which was also not desirable. If we try to put the pipes inside the compressible uh, tip of old sandstone, well obviously that would not be good because uh, we would have increased several. We knew we needed to increase the length of the pipes uh, beyond the typical uh, 45 meters inside uh, a relatively competent uh, limestone. So we ended up uh, using uh, uh, lengths of about up to 105 uh, meters to stop the pipes at the center in this uh, layer. 
we have the tapered uh, file foundation starting from about 45 meters uh, length, 45 meter length, and going on the way to 105 meters uh, at the center. And once we started uh, using a steeple foundation, then uh, convergence between the structural uh, model and the geotechnical model was much more easily achieved. In this graph, we can see how the sediment volumes progressed from a uh, initial set of uh, column loads to the final set of column loads. And uh, we can see that the uh, sediments did not change all that much. However, there was a big difference in uh, the volumes. The walls of the wings, here, here, and here, ended up uh, increasing in load by as much as 50 percent during the first iteration. It shows how sensitive uh, this analysis is to the status of the superstructure. Once we compared, we saw that uh, in between iterations, the changes in the wool loads uh, were very small. We saw that we have uh, achieved the uh, convergence. We provided to the structural engineer a set of 270 different file strings and a set of 16 different area strings. And uh, there was a big uh, range in strings uh, between 200 430 megahertz per meter and then even more, more pronounced change in the area strings between 1.5 and 30 megahertz per meter. Uh, And this is what it looks like to have convergence in uh, segments between the geotechnical model on the left and the structural model on the right. You can see that the bottoms are very close. The difference in segments at the locations of the files were only within uh, 5 millimeters between the convergence. And the difference in file loads using the convergence models were between 0 and 2 megameters. Using the sticker foundation with the higher lengths of the center of the foundation was able to alleviate some of the stresses on the walls on the wings uh, and the cover ratio from the previous 2.2 compared to the center uh, voice stresses to just 1.6, which was something that the structure could uh, handle. And then the final remarks, the geotechnical model typically governs the ground centers. And this iterative process or multi-step process is an insight of the distribution of uh, volume volume. The geotechnical engineer does not have to attempt to model the thickness of the superstructure. If the geotechnical engineer attempts to do that, you will see that uh, you will not be able to reach a convergence with the structure. This is distribution of volume uh, and wall loads is more pronounced when the superstructure is very steep compared to is steep actually compared to the foundation. So this distribution is not typical for uh, all sorts of buildings that are out there. It's more pronounced for structures that are as rigid as this uh, tower. The distribution necessitated to steepen the foundation by using longer piles under the center of uh, the trap. And the longer piles are not needed for an increased uh, soil bearing capacity. We have one with a 45 meter steep. They are needed to alleviate the increased outer wall stresses in the superstructure. With that, I would like to thank you and uh, turn the control back to my colleague. Oh, hey, Costas. Um, so thank you for your presentation. Um, I understand that 
Um, there's some uh, engineers here who have some questions for you. Since we have some extra time here, uh, let's just have a sort of 10 to 15 minute question and answer session. Would that be all right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so actually, I'm going to go and uh, make you the presenter again in case you have to show, in case you have to go back to your slides. Um, so just give me a second here. Okay, and then make sure to, okay, perfect. Um, so I know that several of the engineers here sort of typed into the chat box to ask some questions. Um, do you have access to the chat box right now? Okay, that's okay. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, actually, I'll read them off to you just to make things easier. Um, so first, um, one question that I see here is, was the structure designed for lateral loads such as earthquake and wind loads? If so, how does the pile raft foundation respond to such non-uniform loads over the mat area? The structure was designed for uh, wind loads and was designed for earthquake loads. The wind loads uh, governed uh, the response of uh, they governed the design and uh, were modeled uh, with uh, the finite element uh, model. It's just that uh, this was not uh, shown in this uh, presentation. A pseudo-static uh, lateral load approach was uh, followed, and uh, pile loads and deflections uh, were checked uh, to make sure that uh, 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 satisfying uh, uh, your technical uh, uh, concerns and the structure. Uh, does that answer the question? for uh, his response here. Okay, no response yet, but um, yeah, if you have a follow-up question to that, just type it into the chat box. Um, so I'll just read the, uh, the next question here. It's, um, please explain what initial pile length means. So I think at one point, sort of earlier in your presentation, you sort of discussed initial pile length. So the engineer just wants to know, um, I guess, what exactly that means. Initial pile length means that uh, we did not start with the uh, final configuration where we were trying to figure out uh, what were the lengths of the piles. Initial pile length was a length of 45 meters, which was approximately the thickness of the coralline limestone layer. So we were uh, using uh, as much of the capacity this layer could provide to the piles. And we were uh, checking uh, to see if uh, it's enough to satisfy the design requirements. Okay, thanks, Costas. So I have another question here. Um, how did you estimate the pile's shear and normal stiffness from the results of the O-cell? Oh. Okay, so for uh, finite elements, uh, if you're going to use the embedded pile option, uh, you have to describe the soil or uh, rock pile uh, interface. And uh, what you would do, uh, a neat way to go about it would be to perform a, a no-cell test and have a graph uh, which uh, displays the unit sites here uh, versus the average zone movement. In that case, the initial slope would be the slope that you would uh, describe in uh, the soil pile interface, and uh, the plateau, well, an appropriate plateau, would be where uh, you define your uh, ultimate uh, site C. Now, also for normal uh, stiffness, you would uh, typically need to do a lateral uh, load test and uh, calculate what that uh, normal stiffness would be. 
these uh, voucher tests are uh, used uh, to give the information for a bird alert. Okay, thanks, Costas. So I have another uh, question here. Um, so was there a comparison in the analysis between Midas GTS and other software outputs? I'm sorry, what is the comparison between the two programs? Um, yeah, so did you compare like the outputs of uh, Midas GTS to any other sort of program? So like, for example, if you use another program to do the analysis, did you compare the results? Uh, correct. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we had uh, at least one uh, independent way of checking what the results, uh, if the results we were getting were uh, accurate. So we modeled uh, the same foundation with the same loading uh, using uh, two different engineers and two different uh, pieces of software, uh, either GPS or classes. And uh, we saw that uh, Overall, the results were really close to each other within 10% uh, uh, of settings, which uh, if you uh, think that uh, there are two completely engineers uh, that model uh, with two completely different uh, programs, this uh, foundation rates uh, it's pretty consistent. Okay, thanks. So we have time for just two more questions. So I see just one more. And if anybody has any further questions um, after the session closes, just email them to us and we'll get back to you later. Um, so here's the next question. It's um, how far has construction progressed and how does it match your predictions? Uh, I believe uh, half the pipes have been uh, constructed uh, up to date. And uh, how it matches predictions, uh, we do not have that information uh, yet, so I cannot know. Hopefully it matches predictions. Okay, and then just one last question. Uh, why was the 45 meter depth scheme, uh, why was that selected in your analysis? It was uh, selected uh, what was driving the length was uh, selecting the geotechnical capacity. So we figured that for uh, this kind of uh, diameter and this kind of length, we had uh, sufficient uh, geotechnical capacity to support uh, the tower, which was true. But uh, what happened was that uh, the sediment requirements were not uh, satisfied, and that's why uh, the 45 meter uh, scheme, even though it was appropriate from a capacity point of view, was uh, not enough to uh, satisfy the sediment, the differential sediment uh, requirements. Okay, thanks. So that'll be it for the uh, question and answer session. Thank you for your questions. And once again, if you have any further questions, either for myself or for Costas, um, just uh, email, them, email them to us and we'll get back to you later. Um, so, Costas, can you just uh, switch me to the presenter real quick, and I'll just give the uh, just the closing uh, points of the uh, the session. Okay, so thanks again everyone for taking the time to attend. I just want to make one last announcement before we wrap up. Um, we will be having a follow-up session, or this day, actually a next session uh, next week, on stage excavation and deep foundation design using finite element modeling, uh, specifically with Midas GTS. So for those of you who are interested, uh, more specifically in how GTS can be used maybe for your own projects, um, you know, we highly you know, encourage you to attend the session. We'll be sending out the invitations um, early next week to give you some more information about it. So just you know, mark that down on your calendar uh, next week on the 26th of Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we'll meet again uh, to sort of discuss the finer points of Midas GTS and how it can be used specifically for this type of project. OK, so thank you once again for your attendance. Um, we'll make sure to get the PDH certification out to you guys soon. Um, once again, further questions can be directed to Midasoft at MidasUser.com. Okay. Uh, so thank you again, and we hope you all uh, found this presentation useful. Um, you take care now.
The organizer has ended the session and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.